Root and Butler's weight may have been reduced, but the jerk, when it came, would be more than sufficient to drag her from the locomotive. And if that happened, it was all over. Holly hooked one arm through an external rung, wrapping slim fingers around her wrist. She noticed magical sparks playing over a rip in her suit. They were counteracting the radiation damage. How much longer could her magic last under these conditions? Constant healing really took it out of a girl. She needed to complete the power restoring ritual. And the sooner the better. Holly was about to unclip the cable and attach it to one of the rungs when it snapped taut, pulling her legs from beneath her. She held on grimly to the rung, fingernails digging into her own skin. On reflection, this plan needed a bit of work. Time seemed to stretch, elastic as the cord, and for a moment, Holly thought her elbow would pop right out of its socket. Then the ice gave, and Root and Butler were twanged out of their icy tomb like bolts from a crossbow. They slapped against the side of the train, their reduced weight keeping them aloft, for now. But it was only a matter of time before what little gravity they had pushed them under the steel wheels. Artemis latched onto the rung beside her. What can I do? She nodded at a shoulder pocket. In there. A small vial. Take it out. Artemis ripped open the Velcro flap, pulling out a tiny spray bottle. Okay. Got it. Good. It's up to you now, foul. Up and over. Artemis's mouth dropped open. Up and. Yes. It's our only hope. We have to get this door open to reel in Butler and the commander. There's a bend in the track two clicks back. If this train slows down even one revolution, they're gone. Artemis nodded. The vial. Acid. For the lock. The mechanism is on the inside. Cover your face and squeeze. Give it the whole tube. Don't get any on yourself. It was a long conversation under the circumstances. Especially since every second was a vital one. Artemis did not waste another one on goodbyes. He dragged himself to the next rung, keeping the length of his body pressed close to the carriage. The wind was whipping along the length of the train, tiny motes of ice in every gust. They stung like bees. Nevertheless Artemis pulled his gloves off with chattering teeth. Better frostbite than being crushed beneath the wheels. Upward. One rung at a time, until his head poked above the carriage. Every shred of shelter was now gone. The air pounded his forehead, forcing itself down his throat. Artemis squinted through the blizzard, along the carriage's roof. There in the center. A skylight. Across a desert of steel, blasted smooth as glass by the elements. Not a handhold within 15 feet. The strength of a rhino would be of no use here, Artemis decided. At last an opportunity to use his brain. Kinetics and momentum. Simple enough, in theory. Keeping to the front rim of the carriage, Artemis inched onto the roof. The wind wormed beneath his legs rising him nearly an inch from the deck, threatening to float him off the train. Artemis curled his fingers around the rim. These were not gripping fingers. Artemis hadn't gripped anything bigger than his cell phone in several months. If you wanted someone to type Paradise Lost in under 20 minutes, then Artemis was your man. But as for hanging onto carriage roofs in a blizzard, dead loss. Which, fortunately, was all part of the plan. A millisecond before his finger joints parted company, Artemis let go. The slipstream shot him straight into the skylight's metal housing. Perfect, he would have grunted had there been a cubic centimeter of air in his lungs. But even if he had said it, the wind would have snatched away any words before his own ears heard them. He had moments now before the wind dug its fingers beneath his torso flipping him onto the icy step. Cannon fodder for the goblins. Artemis fumbled the acid vial from his pocket, snapping the top between his teeth. A fleck of the acid flew past his eye. No time to worry about that now. No time for anything. The skylight was secured by a thick padlock. Artemis dribbled two drops into the keyhole. All he could spare. It would have to be enough. The effect was immediate. The acid ate through the metal like lava through ice. Fairy technology. Best under the world. The padlock pinged open, exposing the hatch to the wind's power. The hatch flipped upward, and Artemis tumbled through onto a pallet of barrels. Not exactly the picture of a gallant rescuer. The train's motion shook him from the barrels. Artemis landed face up, gazing at the triple triangle symbol for radiation stamped on the side of each container. At least the barrels were sealed, though rust seemed to have taken hold on quite a few. Artemis rolled across the slatted floor, clambering to his knees alongside the door. Was Captain Short still anchored there, or was he alone now? For the first time in his life. Truly alone. Foul open the door, you pasty-faced mud weasel, ah well. Not alone, then. Covering his face with a forearm, Artemis drenched the carriage's triple bolt with fairy acid. 
The steel lock melted instantly, dripping to the floor like a stream of mercury. Artemis dragged the sliding door back. Holly was hanging on grimly, her face steaming where radiation was eating through the gel. Artemis grabbed her waistband. On three. Holly nodded. No more energy for speech. Artemis flexed his digits. Fingers, don't fail me now. If he ever got out of this, he would buy one of those ridiculous home gymnasiums advertised on the shopping channels. 1. The bend was coming. He could see it out of the corner of his eye. The train would slow down or derail itself. 2. Captain Short's strength was almost spent. The wind rippled her frame like a wind sock. 3. Artemis pulled with all the strength in his thin arms. Holly closed her eyes and let go, unable to believe she was trusting her life to this mud boy. Artemis knew a little something about physics. He timed his count to take advantage of swing, momentum, and the train's own forward motion. But nature always throws something into the mix that can't be anticipated. In this case the something was a slight gap between two sections of the track. Not enough to derail a locomotive, but certainly enough to cause a bump. This bump sent the carriage door crashing into its frame like a five-ton guillotine. But it looked as if Holly had made it. Artemis couldn't really tell because she had crashed into him, sending them both careering into the wooden siding. But she seemed to be intact, from what he could see. At least her head was still attached to her neck, which was good. But she did seem to be unconscious. Probably trauma. Meanwhile, Commander Root had just activated his pit on cordwinch when he received a most unexpected poke in the eye. Artemis knew that he was going to pass out too. He could tell by the darkness eating at the corners of his vision. He slipped sideways, landing on Holly's chest. This had more severe repercussions than you might think. Because Holly was also unconscious, her magic was on autopilot. And unsupervised magic flows like electricity. Artemis's face made contact with the fairy's left hand, diverting the flow of blue sparks. And while this was good for him, it was most definitely bad for her. Because although Artemis didn't know it, Holly needed every spark of magic she could muster. Not all of her had made it inside the train. The goblin de Nall removed a small rectangular mirror from his tunic, and checked to see that his scales were smooth. These cowboy wings are great. You think we'll be allowed keep em? Iman scowled. Not that you'd notice. Goblin lizard ancestry meant that facial movement was pretty limited. Quiet, you hot-blooded fool, hot-blooded. That was a pretty serious insult for one of the Biwa Kel. Denal bristled. Be careful, friend, or I'll tear that forked tongue right out of your head. We won't have a tongue between us if those elves escape, retorted Iman. It was true. The generals did not take disappointment well. So what do we do? I got the looks in this outfit. That must make you the brains. We shoot at the train, interjected Nile. Simple. Denal adjusted his cowboy double decks, hovering across to the squad's junior member. Idiot, he snapped, administering a swift slap to the head. That thing is radioactive, can't you smell it? One stray burst and we'll all be ash floating on the breeze. Good point, admitted Nile. You're not as stupid as you look. Thank you. Welcome. Iman throttled down, descending to 500 feet. It was so tempting. One tightly focused burst to take out the elf clinging to the carriage, another to dispatch the human on the roof. But he couldn't risk it. One degree off target, and he'd sucked his last stinkworm spaghetti. Okay, he announced into his helmet mic. Here's the plan. With all the radiation in that carriage, chances are the targets will be dead in minutes. We follow the train for a while just to make sure. Then we go back and tell the general we saw the bodies. Denal buzzed down beside him. And do we see the bodies? Iman groaned. Of course not, you fool do you want your eyeballs to dry up and fall out? Duh. Exactly. So are we clear? Crystal, said Niall, drawing his soft nose red boy handgun. He shot his comrades from behind. Close range, point blank. They never had a chance. He followed their bodies to earth on full magnification. The snow would cover them in minutes. Nobody would be stumbling over those particular corpses until the polar caps melted. Nile holstered his weapon, punching in the coordinates for the shuttle terminal on his flight computer. If you studied his reptilian face carefully, it was just possible to make out a grin. There was a new lieutenant in town. Chapter 9 No Safe Haven Operations Booth Police Plaza Foley was sitting in front of the LEP mainframe waiting for the results of his latest search. 
Extensive laser brushing on the Goblin shuttle had revealed one complete and one partial thumbprint. The complete print was his own. Easily explicable, as Foley personally inspected all retired shuttle parts. The partial print could well belong to their traitor. Not enough to identify the fairy who'd been running LEP technology to the Biwa Kel, but certainly enough to eliminate the innocent. Cross-reference the remaining names with everybody who had shuttle part access, and the list got considerably shorter. Foley twitched his tail contentedly. Genius. No point in being humble about it. At the moment, the computer was crunching through personnel files with the partial print. All Foley could do was twiddle his thumbs and wait for contact with the surface team. The magma flares were still up. Very unusual. Unusual and coincidental. Foley's suspicious train of thought was interrupted by a familiar voice. Search complete, said the computer, in Foley's own tones, a little vanity. 346 eliminated. 40 possibles remaining. 40. Not bad. They could easily be interviewed. Another opportunity to use the retimager. But there was another way to narrow the field. Computer, cross-reference possibles with level 3 clearance personnel. Level 3 clearance would include everybody with access to the recycling smelters. Referencing. Cudgeon knocked on the booth's security glass. Now, technically Cudgeon shouldn't be allowed in ops, but Foley buzzed him through. He could never resist having a crack at the ex-commander. Cudgeon had been demoted to lieutenant following a disastrous attempt to replace Root as recon head honcho. If it hadn't been for his family's considerable political clout, he would have been booted off the force altogether. All in all, he might have been better off in some other line of work. At least he wouldn't have had to suffer Foley's constant teasing. I have some e-forms for you to initial, said the lieutenant, avoiding eye contact. No problem, commander, chuckled the centaur. How's the plotting going? Any revolutions planned for this afternoon? Just sign the forms please, said Cudgeon, holding out a digi pen. His hand was shaking. Amazing, thought Foley. This broken down shell of an elf was once on the lep fast track. No, but seriously, Cudgeon. You're doing a great job on the form signing thing. Cudgeon's eyes narrowed in suspicion. Thank you, sir. A grin tugged at the corner of Foley's mouth. You're welcome. No need to get a swelled head. Cudgeon's hand flew to his misshapen forehead. Still a touch of the old vanity left. Oops. Sore subject. Sorry about that. There was a spark in the corner of Cudgeon's eye. A spark that should have warned Foley. But he was distracted by a beep from the computer. Excuse me for a moment, Commander. Important business. Computer stuff, you wouldn't understand it. Foley turned to the plasma screen. The lieutenant would just have to wait for his signature. It was probably just an order for shuttle parts anyway. The penny dropped. A big penny with a clang louder than a dwarf's underpants hitting a wall. Shuttle parts. An inside job. Someone with a grudge to settle. A line of sweat filled each groove on Foley's forehead. It was so obvious. He looked at the plasma screen for confirmation of what he already knew. There were only two names. The first, Bomb Arbles, could be eliminated immediately. The retrieval officer had been killed in a core diving accident. The second name pulsed gently. Lieutenant Briar Cudgeon. Demoted to recycling crew around the time Holly retired that starboard booster. It all fit. Foley knew that if he didn't acknowledge the message in 10 seconds, the computer would read the name aloud. He casually punched the delete button. You know, Briar, he croaked. All those jibes about your head problem. It's all in fun. My way of being sympathetic. Actually, I have some ointment. Dot dot quote. Something cold and metallic pressed against the back of the centaur's head. Foley had seen too many action movies not to know what it was. Save your ointment, donkey boy, said Cudgeon's voice in his ear. I have a feeling you'll be developing some head problems of your own. The Mayak chemical train, northern Russia the first thing Artemis felt was a rhythmical knocking, jarring along the length of his spine. 
I'm at the spa in Blackrock, he thought. Irina is massaging my back. Just what my system needs, especially after all that horseplay on that train. Dot dot. The train obviously they were still aboard the Mayak train. The jerking motion was actually the carriage jolting over the track joins. Artemis forced his eyes open, expecting gargantuan doses of stiffness and pain. But instead, he realized, he felt fine. More than fine. Great, in fact. It must be magic. Holly must have healed his various cuts and bruises while he was unconscious. Nobody else was feeling quite so chipper. Especially Captain Short, who was still unconscious. Root was draping a large coat over his fallen officer. Oh. You're awake, are you? He said, without so much as a glance at Artemis. I don't know how you can sleep at all after what you've just done. Done. But I saved you, at least, I helped. You helped, all right, foul. You helped yourself to the last of Holly's magic while she was unconscious. Artemis groaned. It must have happened when they fell. Somehow her magic had been diverted. I see what must have happened. It was an. Root raised a warning finger. Don't say it. The great Artemis Fowl doesn't do anything by accident. Artemis fought against the train's motion, climbing to his knees. It can't be anything serious. Just exhaustion, surely. And suddenly Root's face was an inch from his own, his complexion rosy enough to generate heat. Nothing serious, spluttered the commander, barely able to get the words out past his rage. Nothing serious she lost her trigger finger the door cut it clean off. Her career is over. And because of you, Holly barely had enough magic to stop the bleeding. She's drained of power now. Empty. She lost a finger, echoed Artemis numbly. Not lost, exactly, said the commander, waving the severed digit. It poked me in the eye on the way past. His eye was already beginning to blacken. If we go back now, surely your surgeons can graft it on. Root shook his head. If we could go back now. I have a feeling that the situation underground is a lot different than when we left. If the goblins sent a hit team to get us, you can bet something big is going on underground. Artemis was shocked. Holly had saved all their lives, and this was how he had repaid her. While it was true that he was not directly to blame for the injury, it had been inflicted while trying to save his father. There was a debt to be paid here. How long? He snapped. What? How long ago did it happen? I don't know. A minute. Then there's still time. The commander sat up. Time for what? We can still save the finger. Root rubbed a welt of fresh scar tissue on his shoulder, a reminder of his trip along the side of the train. With what? I barely have enough power left for the mesmer. Artemis closed his eyes. Concentrating. What about the ritual? There must be a way. All the people's magic came from the earth. In order to top up their powers, they had to periodically complete the ritual. How can we complete the ritual here? Artemis racked his brain. He had committed large sections of the fairy book to memory in preparation for the previous year's kidnapping operation. From the earth thy power flows, given through courtesy, so thanks are owed. Pluck thou the magic seed, where full moon, ancient oak, and twisted water meet. And bury it far from where it was found, so return your gift into the ground. He scrambled across the flooring and began patting down Holly's jumpsuit. Root's heart nearly shut down there and then. In heaven's name, mud boy, what are you doing? Artemis didn't even look up. Last year, Holly escaped because she had an acorn. Through some miracle, the commander managed to restrain himself. Five seconds, foul. Talk fast. An officer like Holly wouldn't forget something like that. I'd be willing to bet. Dot dot quote. Root sighed. It's a good idea, mud boy. But the acorns have to be freshly picked. If it hadn't been for the time stop, that seed mightn't have worked. You've got a couple of days, tops. I know Foley and Holly put together some proposal for a sealed acorn unit, but the council rejected it. Heresy apparently. It was a long speech for the commander. He wasn't used to explaining himself. 
but a part of him was hoping. Maybe, just maybe, Holly had never been averse to bending a few rules. Artemis unzipped Captain Short's tunic. There were two tiny items on the gold chain around her neck. Her copy of the book, The Fairy Bible. Artemis knew that it would combust if he tried to touch it without Holly's permission. But there was another item. A small plexiglass sphere filled with earth. That's against regulations, said Root, not sounding too upset. Holly stirred, half emerging from her stupor. Hey, Commander, what happened to your eye? Artemis ignored her, cracking the tiny sphere against the carriage floor. Earth and a small acorn tumbled into his palm. Now all we need to do is bury it. The commander slung Holly over his shoulder. Artemis tried not to look at the space where her index finger used to be. Then it's time to get off this train. Artemis glanced at the Arctic landscape whipping past outside the carriage. Getting off the train wasn't as easy as the commander made it sound. Butler dropped nimbly through the overhead hatch, where he'd been keeping an eye on the goblin hit squad. Nice to see you're so limber, commented Artemis dryly. The manservant's smile. Good to see you, too, Artemis. Well, what did you see up there? said Root, interrupting the reunion. Butler placed a hand on his young master's shoulders. They could talk later. The goblins are gone. Funny thing. Two of them dropped low for reconnaissance, then the other one shot them in the back. Root nodded. Power play. Goblins are their own worst enemies. But right now, we've got to get off this train. There's another bend coming up in about half a click, said Butler. That's our best chance. So, how do we disembark? asked Artemis. Butler grinned. Disembark is a pretty gentle term for what I have in mind. Artemis groaned. More running and jumping. Operations Booth Foley's brain was bubbling like a sea slug in a deep fat fryer. He still had options, providing Cudgeon didn't actually shoot him. One shot and it was all over. Centaurs didn't have magic. Not a drop. They got by on brains alone. That and their ability to trample their enemies underfoot. But Foley had a feeling that Briar wouldn't plug him just yet. Too busy gloating. Hey, Foley, said the lieutenant. Why don't you go for the intercom? See what happens. Foley could guess what would happen. Don't worry, Briar. No sudden moves. Cudgeon laughed, and he sounded genuinely happy. Briar. First name terms now is it. You mustn't realize how much trouble you're in. Foley was starting to realize just that. Beyond the tinted glass, leptekis were beavering away trying to track down the mole, oblivious to the drama being played out not two yards away. He could see and hear them, but it was one-way surveillance. The centaur only had himself to blame. He had insisted that the operations booth be constructed to his own paranoid standards. A titanium cube with blast-proof windows. The entire room was wireless, without even a fiber-optic cable to connect operations to the outside world. Totally impregnable. Unless of course you opened the door to throw a few insults at an old enemy. Foley groaned. His mother had always said that his smart mouth would get him into trouble. But all was not lost. He still had a few tricks up his sleeve. A plasma floor for instance. So what's this all about, Cudgeon? Asked the centaur, drawing his hooves off the tiles. And please don't say, world domination. Cudgeon continued to smile. This was his moment. Not immediately. The lower elements will suffice for now. But why? Cudgeon's eyes were tinged with madness. Why? You have the gall to ask me why. I was the the council's golden boy in 50 years I would have been chairman and then along comes the Artemis Fowl affair. In one short day all my hopes are dashed. I end up deformed and demoted and it was all because of you, Foley. You and Roots are the only way to get my life back on track is to discredit both of you. You will be blamed for the goblin attacks, and Julius will be dead and dishonored. And as an added bonus, I even get Artemis Fowl. It's as close to perfect as I could have hoped for. Foley snorted. Do you really think you can defeat the Lep with a handful of soft-nosed weapons? Defeat the Lep. 
Why would I want to do that? I am a hero of the Lep. Or rather I will be. You will be the villain of this piece. We'll see about that, baboon face, said Foley, activating a switch, that sent an infrared signal to a receiver in the floor. In half a second, a secret membrane of plasma would warm up. Half a second later a neutrino charge would spread across the plasma gel like wildfire, bouncing anyone connected to the floor off at least three walls. In theory, Kudjan giggled delightedly. Don't tell me. Your plasma tiles aren't working. Foley was flummoxed. Momentarily. Then he lowered his hooves and gingerly pressed another button. This one engaged a voice-activated laser. The centaur held his breath. No plasma tiles, continued Kudjan. And no voice-activated laser. You really are slipping, Foley. Not that I'm surprised. I always knew you'd be exposed for the donkey you are. The lieutenant settled into a swivel chair, propping his feet on the computer bank. So have you figured it out yet? Foley thought. Who could it be? Who could beat him at his own game? Not Cudgeon, that was for sure. A techno fool if there ever was one. No, there was only one person with the know-how to deactivate the booth's safety measures. Opal Cowboy, he breathed. Cudgeon patted his head. That's right. Opal did a little reprogramming during the upgrading work. And the funny thing is, the council footed the bill. She even charged for the spy cameras. Even now, the Biwakel are preparing to launch their attack on the city. Lep weapons and communications are down, and the best thing is that you, my horsey friend, will be held responsible. After all, you have locked yourself in the operations booth in the middle of a crisis. Nobody will believe it, protested Foley. Oh, yes they will, especially when you disengage the LEP security, including the DNA cannons. Which I won't be doing any time soon. Cudgeon twirled a matte black remote between his fingers. I'm afraid it's not up to you anymore. Foley swallowed. You mean. Dot dot quote. That's right, said Cudgeon. Nothing works unless I press the button. He pressed the button. And even if Foley had had the reactions of a sprite, he would never have had time to draw up all his hooves before the plasma shock blasted him right out of his specially modified swivel chair. Arctic Circle Butler instructed everyone to attach themselves to the moonbelt, one per link. Floating slightly in the buffeting wind, the group maneuvered itself to the carriage doorway like a drunken crab. It's simple physics, Artemis told himself. Reduced gravity will prevent us being dashed against the Arctic ice. In spite of all his logic, when Root launched the group into the night, Artemis couldn't hold back a single gasp. Later, when he replayed the incident in his mind's eye, Artemis would edit out the breath. The slipstream spun him beyond the railway sleepers, into a drift. Butler turned off the anti-gravity belt a second before impact. Otherwise they could have bounced away like men on the moon. Root was first to detach, scooping handfuls of snow from the surface until his fingers reached the compacted ice below. He heard a click behind his shoulder. Stand back, advised Butler, taking aim with his handgun. Root obliged, shielding his eyes with a forearm. Ice slivers could blind you just as efficiently as six-inch nails. Butler put a full clip into a three-inch spread blasting a shallow hollow in the frozen surface. Instant sleep drenched the already sodden group. Root was checking the results before the smoke cleared. They had seconds left before Holly's time ran out. After a certain time it mightn't be wise to attempt a graft. Even if they could, the commander jumped into the dip, sweeping aside layers of loose ice. There was a disc of brown among the white. Yes, he crowed. Earth. Butler lowered Holly's twitching form into the hole. She seemed like a doll in his powerful hands. Tiny and limp. Root curled Holly's fingers around the illegal acorn, thrusting her left hand deep into the shattered soil. He pulled a roll of tape from his belt, crudely securing the finger to roughly its original position. The elf and two humans gathered around and waited. It mightn't take, muttered Root nervously. This sealed acorn thing is new. Never been tested. Foley and his ideas. But they usually work. They usually do. 
Artemis laid a hand on his shoulder. It was all he could think to do. Giving comfort was not one of his strong points. Five seconds. Ten. Nothing. Then. Look. Cried Artemis. A spark. A solitary blue spark traveled lazily along the length of Holly's arm, winding along the veins. It crossed her chest, climbed her pointed chin and sank into the flesh right between the eyes. Stand back, advised Root. I saw a two-minute healing in Tulsa one night. Damn near destroyed an entire shuttle port. I've never even heard of a four-minuter. They backpedaled to the lip of the crater, and not a moment too soon. More sparks erupted from the earth, targeting Holly's hand as the area most in need of assistance. They sank into her finger joint like plasma torpedoes, melting the plastic tape. Holly shot upright, arms swinging like a puppet. Her legs began to jerk, kicking invisible enemies. Then from her vocal cords came a high-pitched keening that cracked the thinner sheets of ice. Is this normal? whispered Artemis, as though Holly could hear. I think so, answered the commander. The brain is running a systems check. It's not like fixing cuts and bruises, if you know what I mean. Every pore in Holly's body started to steam, venting trace radiation. She thrashed and steamed, sinking in a pool of slush. Not a pretty sight. The water evaporated, shrouding the lep captain in mist. Only her left hand was visible, fingers a desperate blur. Holly suddenly stopped moving. Her hand froze, then dropped through the mist. The Arctic night rushed in to reclaim the silence. They inched closer, leaning into the fog. Artemis wanted to see, but he was afraid to look. Butler took a breath, batting aside sheets of mist. All was quiet below. Holly's frame lay still as the grave. Artemis peered at the shape in the hole. I think she's awake. Dot. 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 Quote. He was cut short by Captain Short's sudden return to consciousness. She bolted upright, icicles coating her eyelashes and auburn hair. Her chest ballooned as she swallowed huge gulps of air. Holly winked at an amazed butler. Now we're even, she said. Commander Root didn't have many treasured memories. But in future days, when things were at their grimmest, he would conjure up this moment and have a quiet chuckle. Operations Booth Foley woke up sore, which was unusual for him. He couldn't even remember the last time he'd experienced actual pain. His feelings had been hurt a few times by Julius's barbed comments, but actual physical discomfort was not something he cared to endure when he could avoid it. The centaur was lying on the operations booth floor, tangled in the remains of his office chair. Cudgeon, he growled, and what followed was about two minutes worth of unprintable obscenity. When he had finally vented his anger the centaur's brain kicked in, and he hauled himself from the plasma tiles. His rump was singed. He was going to have a couple of bald spots on his hindquarters. Very unattractive on a centaur. It was the first thing a prospective mate looked for in the nightclubs. Not that Foley had ever been much of a dancer. Four left hooves. The booth was sealed. Tighter than a gnome's wallet, as the saying went. Foley typed in his exit code. Foley. Doors. The computer remained silent. He tried verbal. Foley. 121 override. Doors. Not a peep. He was trapped. A prisoner of his own security devices. Even the windows were set to blackout, blocking his view of the operations room. Completely locked out, and locked in. Nothing worked. Well, that wasn't completely accurate. Everything worked, but his precious computers wouldn't respond to his touch. And Foley was only too well aware that there was no way out of the booth without access to the mainframe. Foley plucked the tinfoil hat from his head, crunching it into a ball. A lot of good you did me, he said, tossing it into the waste recycler. The recycler would analyze the chemical makeup of the item, then divert it to the appropriate tank. A plasma monitor crackled into life on the wall. Opal Cowboy's magnified face appeared, grinning the widest grin the centaur had ever seen. Hello, Foley. Long time no see. Foley returned the grin, but his wasn't quite as wide. Opal. How nice to see you. How are the folks? 
Everyone knew how Opal had bankrupted her father. It was a legend in the corporate world. Very well, thanks. Cumulus House is a lovely asylum. Foley decided he would try sincerity. It was a tool he didn't use very often. But there was a first time for everything. Opal, think about what you're doing. Cudgeon is insane, for pity's sake. Once he has what he wants, he will dispose of you in a heartbeat, the pixie shook a perfectly manicured finger. No, Foley, you're wrong. Briar needs me. He really does. He'd be nothing without me and my gold. The centaur looked deep into Opal's eyes. The pixie actually believed what she was saying. How could someone so brilliant be so deluded? I know what this is all about, Opal. Oh, you do? Yes. You're still sore because I won the science medal back in university. For a second Cowboy's composure slipped, and her features didn't seem quite so perfect. That medal was mine, you stupid centaur. My wing design was far superior to your ridiculous iris cam. You won because you were a male. And that's the only reason. Foley grinned satisfied. Even with the odds so hugely against him, he hadn't lost the ability to be the most annoying creature under the world when he wanted to be. So what do you want, Opal? Or did you just call to chat about our school days? Opal took a long drink from a crystal glass. I just called, Foley, to let you know I'm watching, so don't try anything. I also wanted to show you something from the security cameras downtown. This is live footage by the way, and Briar is with the council right now, blaming you for it. Happy viewing. Opal's face disappeared to be replaced by a high-angle view of downtown Haven. A tourist district, outside Spud Spud Emporium. Generally, this area would be thronged with Atlantean couples taking photos of each other in front of the fountain. But not today, because today the square was a battleground. The Biwakel were waging open war with the Lep, and by the looks of things, it was a one-sided battle. The goblins were firing their soft-nosed weapons, but the police were not shooting back. They just huddled behind whatever shelter they could find. Completely helpless. Foley's jaw dropped. This was disastrous. And he was being blamed for everything. Of course, the thing about stool pigeons was, they could not be left alive to protest their innocence. He had to get a message to Holly, and fast, or they were all dead fairies. Chapter 10 Trouble and Strife Downtown Haven Spud Spud Emporium was not a place you wanted to be on the best of days. The fries were greasy, the meat was mysterious, and the milkshakes had gristly lumps. Nevertheless, the Emporium did a roaring trade, especially during the solstice. At this precise moment, Captain Trouble Kelp would almost have preferred to be inside the fast food joint choking down a rubbery burger than outside it dodging lasers. Almost. With Root out of the picture, field command fell to Captain Kelp. Usually this was a responsibility he would have relished. But then again, usually he would have had the benefit of transport and weapons. Thankfully, they still had communications. Trouble and his patrol had been scouring Biwakel hotspots when they were bushwhacked by a hundred members of the reptilian triad. The goblins had positioned themselves on the rooftops, catching the Lep squad in a deadly crossfire from soft-nosed lasers and fireballs. Pretty complex thinking for the Biwa Kel. The average goblin found simultaneous scratching and spitting a challenge. They had to be getting their orders from someone. Trouble and one of his junior corporals were pinned down behind a photo booth, while the remaining officers had managed to take cover in Spud's Emporium. For the moment they were keeping the goblins at bay with lasers and buzz batons. The lasers had a range of 10 yards, and the buzz batons were only good for close quarters. Both ran on electric batteries and would run out eventually. After that they were down to rocks and bare fists. They didn't even have the advantage of shielding, since the Biwakel were equipped with LEP combat helmets. Older models certainly, but still fitted with anti-shield filters. A fireball arced over the booth, melting through the asphalt at their feet. The goblins were wising up. Relatively speaking, instead of trying to blast through the booth, they were lobbing missiles over it. Time was short now. 
Trouble tapped his mic. Kelp to base. Anything on weapons? Not a thing, Cap, came the reply. Plenty of officers, with nothing to shoot, CEPT their fingers. We're charging up the old, electric guns, but that's gonna take eight hours minimum. There are a couple of body armor suits over in recon, I'm having them double timed over there right now. Five minutes. Tops. Darvit, swore the captain. They were going to have to move. Any second now this booth would fall apart, and they would be sitting ducks for goblin fire. Beside him the corporal was quivering in terror. For heaven's sake, snapped trouble. Pull yourself together. You shut up, retorted his brother Grub through wobbly lips. You were supposed to look out for me. Mommy said. Trouble waved a threatening finger. It's Captain Kelp while we're on duty, Corporal. And for your information, I am looking out for you. Oh, this is looking out for me, is it? Pouted Grub. Trouble didn't know who annoyed him more, his kid brother or the goblins. Okay, Grub. This booth isn't going to last much longer. We've got to make a break for the Emporium. Understand. Grub's wobbling lip suddenly stiffened considerably. No chance. I'm not moving. You can't make me. I don't mind if I stay here for the rest of my life. Trouble raised his visor. Listen to me. If you stay, the rest of your life is going to be about 30 seconds. We have to go. But the goblins, Trub. Captain Kelp grabbed his brother by the shoulders. Don't you worry about the goblins. You worry about my foot connecting with your behind if you slow down. Grub winced. He'd had that experience before. We're going to be all right, aren't we, brother? Trouble winked. Of course we are. I'm the captain, aren't I? His little brother nodded, lip losing its stiffness. Good. Now you point your nose at the door, and go when I say. Got it. More nodding. Grub's chin was bobbing faster than a woodpecker's beak. Right corporal. Stand by. On my command. Dot dot quote. Another fireball. Closer this time. Black smoke rose from Trouble's rubber soles. The captain poked his nose around the wall. A laser burst almost gave him a third nostril. A steel sandwich board spun around the corner, dancing with the force of a dozen charges. Photo finish the sign said. Or photo finish to be precise. The O had been blasted out of it. Not laserproof, then. But it would have to do. Trouble snared the revolving board, draping it over his shoulders. Armor, of sorts. The lep suits were lined with microfilaments that would dissipate neutrino blasts or even sonic bursts, but soft noses hadn't been used underground for decades. A burst would tear through the lep uniform as if it were so much rice paper. He poked his brother in the back. Ready. Grub may have nodded, or it may have been that his entire body was shaking. Trouble gathered his legs beneath him, adjusting the sandwich board across his chest and back. It would withstand a couple of rounds. After that, his own body would be providing cover for Grub. Another fireball, directly between them and the Emporium. In a moment the flame would sink a hole in the tarmac. They had to go now. Through the fire. Seal your helmet, why? Just seal it, Corporal. Grub did. You could argue with a brother, but not a commanding officer. Trouble placed a hand on Grub's back and pushed. Hard. Go, 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 they went, straight through the white heart of the flame. Trouble heard the filaments in his suit pop as they tried to cope with the heat. Boiling tar sucked at his boots, melting the rubber soles. Then they were through, stumbling toward the double doors. Trouble scrubbed the soot from his visor. His men were waiting, huddled behind riot shields. Two paramedic warlocks had their gloves off, ready to lay on hands. Ten yards to go. The goblins found range. A hail of charges sang through the air around them, pulverizing what was left of the Emporium's shop front. Trouble's crown lurched forward as a slug flattened itself against his helmet. More charges. Lower down. A tight grouping, between his shoulder blades. The sandwich board held. The impact lifted the captain like a kite, slapping him into his brother, and carrying them both through the decimated double doors. They were instantly hauled behind a wall of riot shields. Grub, 
gasped Captain Kelp. Through the pain and noise and soot. Is he okay? Fine, answered the senior warlock paramedic, rolling trouble onto his stomach. Your back, on the other hand, is going to have some lovely bruises in the morning. Captain Kelp waved the warlock away. Any word from the commander? The warlock shook his head. Nothing. Root is missing in action and Cudgeon has been reinstated as commander. Even worse, now they're saying Foley is behind this whole thing. Trouble paled, and it wasn't from the pain in his back. Foley it can't be true. Trouble ground his teeth in frustration. Foley and the commander. He had no choice, he would have to do it. The one thing he had had nightmares about. Captain Kelp struggled up onto one elbow. The air above their heads was alive with the buzz of soft nose bursts. It was only a matter of time before they were completely overrun. It had to be done. Trouble took a breath. Okay, people, listen up. Retreat to police plaza. The troops froze. Even Grub caught himself in midsub. Retreat. You heard me, snarled Trouble. Retreat. We can't hold the streets without arms. Now move it out. The lep shuffled to the service entrance, unaccustomed to losing. Call it retreat, call it a tactical maneuver. It was still running away. And who would have thought that order would ever come out of trouble kelp's mouth? Arctic shuttleport Artemis and his fellow travelers took shelter in the shuttleport. Holly made the journey slung over Butler's shoulder. She protested loudly for several minutes, until the commander ordered her to shut up. You've just had major magical surgery, he pointed out. So just stay quiet and do your exercises. It was vital that Holly manipulate her finger constantly for the next hour or so, to ensure the right tendons got reconnected. It's very important to move the index finger the way you intend to move it, especially if you're firing a weapon. They huddled around a glow cube in the deserted departures lounge. Any water? asked Holly. I feel dehydrated after that healing. Root winked, something that didn't happen very often. Here's a little trick I learned in the field. He popped a flat-nosed shell from a clip in his belt. It was transparent and filled with clear liquid. You won't get much of a drink from that, commented Butler. More than you'd think. This is a hydrogen shell. A miniature fire extinguisher. The water is compressed into a tiny space. You fire it into the heart of a fire and the impact reverses the compressor. Half a gallon of water is blasted at the flames. More effective than a hundred gallons poured. We call them fizzers. Very good, said Artemis dryly. If you could use your weapons. Don't need em, said Root, drawing a large knife. Manual works just as well. He pointed the shell's flat tip at the mouth of a canteen, and popped the lid. A fizzing spray jetted into the container. There you are, Captain. Never let it be said that I don't look after my officers. Clever, admitted Artemis. And the best thing is, said the commander, pocketing the empty fizzer, these things are completely reusable. All I have to do is stick it in a pile of snow and the compressor will do the rest, so I won't even have Foley on my case for wasting equipment. Holly took a long drink, and soon the color surged back to her cheeks. So we were ambushed by a Biwakel hit team, she mused. What does that mean? It means you have a leak, said Artemis holding his hands close to the cube's warmth. It was my impression that this mission was top secret. Not even your council was informed. The only person who isn't here is that centaur. Holly jumped to her feet. Foley. It can't be. Artemis raised his palms. Logic. That's all it is. This is all very well, interjected the commander. But it's conjecture. We need to assess our situation. What have we got, and what do we know for sure? Butler nodded. The commander was a being after his own heart. A soldier. Root answered his own question. We've still got the shuttle, provided it's not wired. There's a locker full of provisions. Atlantean food mostly, so get used to fish and squid. And what do we know? Artemis took over. We know that the goblins have a source in the lep. We also know if they tried to take out the LEP's head, Commander Root, then they must be after the body. The best chance of success would be to mount both operations simultaneously. Holly chewed her lip. So that means. 
Dot, dot, quote. That means there is probably some kind of revolution going on underground. The B were kill against the LEP, scoffed Holly. No problem. Generally, that may be true, agreed Artemis. But if your weapons are out, then so are theirs, said Root. Artemis moved closer to the glow cube. Worst case scenario, Haven has been taken by the Biwakel and the council members are either dead or imprisoned. Quite honestly, things look grim. Neither fairy responded. Grim hardly did the situation justice. Disastrous was closer to the mark. Even Artemis was slightly disheartened. None of this was helping his father. I suggest we rest here for a while, pack some provisions, and then proceed toward Murmansk as soon as we get some cloud cover. Butler can search this man Vasikin's apartment. Perhaps we will be lucky, and my father will be there. I realize that we are at a slight disadvantage without weapons, but we still have surprise on our side. No one spoke for several moments. It was an uneasy silence. Everybody knew what should be said, but nobody wanted to say it. Artemis, said Butler eventually, laying a hand on the boy's shoulder. We're in no shape to go up against the Mafia. We don't have any firepower, and our colleagues need to get underground, so we don't have any magic. If we go in there now, we're not coming out. Any of us. Artemis stared deep into the heart of the glow cube. But my father is so close, Butler. I can't give up now. In spite of herself, Holly was touched by his unwillingness to give up, against all the odds. She was certain that, for once, Artemis wasn't trying to manipulate anybody. He was simply a boy who missed his father. Maybe her defenses were down, but she felt sorry for him. We're not giving up, Artemis, she said softly. We're regrouping. There's a difference. We'll be back. Remember, it's always darkest before the dawn. Artemis looked at her. What dawn? We're in the Arctic, remember? Operations Booth Foley was furious with himself. After all the security encryptions he'd built into his systems, Opal Cowboy had simply strolled in here and hijacked the entire network. And what's more, the LEP had paid her for the job. The Centaur had to admire her nerve. It was a brilliantly simple plan. Apply for the upgrade contract, submit the lowest estimate. Get the LEP to give you an access all areas chip and then piggyback spy cams on the local systems. Foley would be willing to bet that Opal had even billed the LEP for the surveillance equipment. Foley pushed a few buttons experimentally. No response. Not that he'd expected any. Doubtless Opal Cowboy had everything wired down to the last fiber optic. Perhaps she was watching him at this very moment. He could just imagine her. Coiled up on a cowboy hoverboy giggling at the plasma screen. His greatest rival, gloating over his destruction. Foley growled. She may have caught him off guard once, but it wouldn't happen again. He would not go to pieces for Opal Cowboy's entertainment. Dot. Dot dot. Then again, maybe he would. The centaur began to heave theatrical sobs, peeping out between his fingers. Now, if I were a button camera, where would I hide? Somewhere the sweeper wouldn't check. Foley glanced at the bug sweeper, a small complex-looking mass of cables and chips attached to the roof. The only place the sweeper didn't check was inside the sweeper itself. Now he knew Opal's vantage point, for all the good it did him. If the camera was piggybacking inside the sweeper, there would be a small blind spot directly below the unit's titanium casing. The pixie could still see everything of importance. He was still locked out of the computer, and locked in the operations booth. The centaur cradled his head between his hands, the picture of a beaten fairy. In fact he was scanning the booth. What had come in since the cowboy upgrades? There must be some untainted equipment. But there was nothing except junk. A roll of fiber optic cable. A few conductor clips and a few tools. Nothing useful. Then something winked at him from beneath a workstation. A green light. Foley's heart jumped 10 beats per minute. He knew instantly what it was. Artemis Fowl's laptop computer. Complete with modem and email capability. He willed himself to maintain calm. Opal Cowboy couldn't possibly have bugged it. The device had only come in hours ago. He hadn't even got around to dismantling it yet. 
The centaur clocked across to his toolbox, and in a fit of frustration dumped the contents onto the plasma tiles. He was not so frustrated that he forgot to snag some cable and snips. The next step in his fake breakdown was to flop onto the worktop sobbing uncontrollably. Naturally, he had to flop over the precise spot where Holly had left the laptop. With a casual kick, Foley slid the computer into the space where the sweeper's blind spot should be. So far, so good. Foley popped the laptop's lid, and quickly shut off the speakers. Humans would insist on their machines beeping at the most inopportune moments. He allowed one hand to drag across the keyboard and moments later he was in the email program. Now for the problem. Wireless internet access is one thing, but access from the center of the earth is quite another. Cradling his head in the crook of one arm, Foley jimmied one end of a fiber optic cable into a scope uplink port. The scopes were shrouded trackers concealed on American communications satellites. Now he had an aerial. Let's hope Mudboy was switched on. Cowboy Laboratories Opal Cowboy had never had so much fun. The underworld was literally her plaything. She stretched on her cowboy hoverboy like a contented cat, eyes devouring the chaos on the plasma monitors. The LEP had no chance. It was only a matter of time before the Biwakel gained access to Police Plaza, then the city was theirs. Next came Atlantis, then the human world. Opal floated between screens, soaking up every detail. In the city, goblins flowed from every inch of darkness, armed and thirsty for blood. Soft-nosed slugs ripped chunks from historic edifices. Ordinary fairies barricaded themselves in their houses, praying that the marauding gangs would pass them by. Businesses were looted and torched. Not too much torching, she hoped. Opal Cowboy had no desire to be queen of a war zone. A comm screen opened on the main display. It was Cudgeon on their secure line. And he seemed actually happy. The cold happiness of revenge. Briar, squealed Opal. This is wonderful. I wish you were here to see it. Soon. I must remain with my troops. After all, because I was the one who unearthed Foley's treachery, the council has reinstated me as commander. How is our prisoner? Opal glanced at the Foley screen. Disappointing, frankly. I expected some plotting. An escape attempt, at least. But all he does is mope about and throw the odd tantrum. Cudgeon's smile widened. Suicidal, I expect. In fact I'm certain of it. Then the recently promoted commander was all business again. What of the LEP? Any unexpected brainwaves? No. Exactly as you predicted. They are cowering in police plaza like tortoises in their shells. Shall I shut off local communications? Cudgeon shook his head. No. They forecast their every move on their so-called secure channels. Keep them open. Just in case. Opal Cowboy hovered closer to the screen. Tell me again, Briar. Tell me about the future. For a moment, annoyance flashed across Cudgeon's face. But today, of all days, his good humor could not be suppressed for long. The council has been told that Foley has orchestrated the sabotage from his locked operations booth. But you shall miraculously override the Centaur's program and return control of Police Plaza's DNA cannons to the LEP. Those ridiculous goblins shall be overrun. I shall be the hero of the resistance, and you shall be my princess. Every military contract for the next 500 years shall belong to Cowboy Laboratories. Opal's breath caught in her throat. And then, and then, together we will rid the earth of these tiresome mud men. That, my dear, is the future. Arctic Shuttleport Artemis's phone rang. Something even he hadn't anticipated. Artemis stripped off a glove with his teeth, tearing the mobile phone from its Velcro strip. Text message, he said, navigating through the cell phone's menu. No one has this number except Butler. Holly folded her arms. Obviously, someone does. Artemis ignored her tone. It must be Foley. He's been monitoring my wireless communications for months. Either he's using my computer, or he's found a way to unify our platforms. I see, said Butler and Root together. Two big lies. Holly was unimpressed by all the jargon. So what does it say? Artemis tapped the tiny screen. See for yourself. 
Captain Short took the cell phone, scrolling through the message. Her face grew longer with each line. CMNDR root. TRBLE below. How an OVERRN by GOBLNS. PLICE Plaza SRROUNDED. CUDGEON plus OPLKBOIBHND plot. No WPONSRCMMUNICATIONS. DNACNONSCNTRLLED by KBOI. IMTRPPED in op BTH. CNCL thanks IM2BLM. If alive PLSEHLP. If not, WRNGNMBR. Holly swallowed, her throat suddenly dry. This is not good. The commander jumped to his feet, grabbing the cell phone. No, he declared moments later. It certainly isn't. Cudgeon all the time it was Cudgeon. Why didn't I see it? Can we get a message to Foley? Artemis considered it. No there's no network here. I'm surprised we could even receive. Couldn't you rig it somehow? Certainly. Just give me six months, some specialized equipment and three miles of steel girder. Holly snorted. Some criminal mastermind you turned out to be. Butler placed a gentle hand on her shoulder. Shush, he whispered. Artemis is thinking. Artemis stared deep into the glow cube's liquid plasma heart. We have two options, he began after a moment. Nobody interrupted, not even Holly. After all it had been Artemis Fowl who devised a way to escape the fairy time field. We could get some human aid. No doubt some of Butler's more dubious acquaintances could be persuaded to help, for a fee of course. Root shook his head. No good. They could be mind wiped afterward. Sometimes wipes don't take. The last thing we need is mercenaries with residual memories. Option 2. We break into cowboy laboratories, and return weapons control to the LEP. The commander guffaw. Break into cowboy laboratories. Are you serious? That entire compound is built on bedrock. There are no windows, and they have blast-resistant walls, and DNA stun cannons. Any unauthorized personnel who come within a hundred yards get blasted right between the pointy ears. Butler whistled. Seems like a whole lot of hardware for an engineering company. I know, side route. Cowboy Labs had special permits. I signed them myself. Butler considered it for several moments. Can't be done, he pronounced eventually. Not without the blueprints. Darvit, swore the commander. I never thought I'd say this, but there's only one fairy for a job like this. Holly nodded. Mulch Diggums. Diggums, a dwarf. Career criminal. The only fairy ever to break into cowboy laboratories and live. Unfortunately, we lost him last year. Tunneling out of your manor, as it happens. I remember him, said Butler. Nearly took my head off. A slippery character. Root laughed softly. Eight times I nabbed old Mulch. The last one was for the cowboy lab's job. As I recall, Mulch and his cousin set up as building contractors. A way to get plans for secure facilities. They got the cowboy contract. Mulch left himself a back door. Typical Diggums, he breaks into the most secure facility under the planet, then tries to sell an alchemy vat to one of my squeals. Artemis sat up. Alchemy. You have alchemy vats. Stop drooling, mud boy. They're experimental. The ancient warlocks used to be able to turn lead into gold, according to the book, but the secret was lost. Even Opal Cowboy hasn't managed it yet. Oh, said Artemis, disappointed. Believe it or not, I almost miss that criminal. He had a way of insulting a person. Root glanced toward the heavens. I wonder if he's up there now, looking down on us. In a manner of speaking, said Holly guiltily. Actually, Commander, Mulch Diggums is in Los Angeles. Chapter 11 Mulch Ado About Nothing Los Angeles Mulch Diggums was, in fact, outside the apartment of an Oscar-winning actress. Of course, she didn't know he was there. And naturally he was up to no good. Once a thief, always a thief. Not that Mulch needed the money. He'd done very well out of the Artemis Fowl siege. Well enough to take out a lease on a penthouse apartment in Beverly Hills. 
He'd stocked the apartment with a Pioneer Entertainment System, a full DVD library, and enough beef jerky to last a lifetime. Time for a decade of rest and relaxation. But life is not like that. It refuses to curl up and sit quietly in a corner. The habits of several centuries would not go away. Halfway through the James Bond collection, Mulch realized that he missed the bad old days. Soon the penthouse suite's reclusive occupant was taking midnight strolls. These strolls generally ended up inside other people's homes. Initially, Mulch just visited, savoring the thrill of defeating sophisticated mudman security systems. Then he began to take trophies. Small things, a crystal goblet, an ashtray, or a cat, if he was peckish. But soon Mulch Diggums began to crave the old notoriety, and his pilferings grew larger. Gold bars, goose egg diamonds, or pit bull terriers, if he was really famished. The Oscar thing began quite by accident. He nabbed one as a curiosity on a midweek break to New York. Best original screenplay. The following morning he was front page news coast to coast. You'd think he'd ripped off a medical convoy instead of a gilded statuette. Mulch, of course, was delighted. He'd found his new nocturnal pastime. In the next two weeks, Mulch filched Best Soundtrack and Best Special Effects Academy Awards. The tabloids went crazy. They even gave him a nickname, The Grouch, after another well-known Oscar. When Mulch read that one, his toes wriggled for joy. And dwarf toes wriggling are quite a sight. They are nimble as fingers, double-jointed, and the less said about the smell, the better. Mulch's mission became clear. He had to assemble an entire set. Over the next six months, the grouch struck all across the United States. He even made a trip to Italy to collect a Best Foreign Language Film Award. He had a special cabinet made with tinted glass that could be blacked out at the touch of a button. Mulch Diggums felt alive again. Of course, Oscar winners all over the planet tripled their security, which was just the way Mulch liked it. There was no challenge in breaking into a shack on the beach. High rise and high tech. That's what the public wanted. So that's what the grouch gave them. The papers ate it up. He was a hero. During the daylight hours, when he couldn't venture outside, Mulch busied himself writing the screenplay of his own exploits. Tonight was a big night. The last statuette. He was going for a Best Actress award. And not just any old Best Actress. Tonight's target was the tempestuous Jamaican beauty Maggie V. This year's winner for her portrayal of Precious, a tempestuous Jamaican beauty. Darvit, swore the commander. I never thought I'd say this, but there's only one fairy for a job like this. Holly nodded. Mulch Diggums. Diggums, a dwarf. Career criminal. The only fairy ever to break into cowboy laboratories and live. Unfortunately, we lost him last year. Tunneling out of your manor, as it happens. I remember him, said Butler. Nearly took my head off. A slippery character. Root laughed softly. Eight times I nabbed old Mulch. The last one was for the cowboy lab's job. As I recall, Mulch and his cousin set up as building contractors. A way to get plans for secure facilities. They got the cowboy contract. Mulch left himself a back door. Typical Diggums, he breaks into the most secure facility under the planet then tries to sell an alchemy vat to one of my squeals. Artemis sat up. Alchemy. You have alchemy vats. Stop drooling, mud boy. They're experimental. The ancient warlocks used to be able to turn lead into gold, according to the book, but the secret was lost. Even Opal Cowboy hasn't managed it yet. Oh, said Artemis, disappointed. Believe it or not, I almost miss that criminal. He had a way of insulting a person. Root glanced toward the heavens. I wonder if he's up there now, looking down on us. In a manner of speaking, said Holly guiltily. Actually, Commander, Mulch Diggums is in Los Angeles. Chapter 11 Mulch Ado About Nothing Los Angeles Mulch Diggums was, in fact, outside the apartment of an Oscar-winning actress. Of course, she didn't know he was there. And naturally he was up to no good. Once a thief, always a thief. Not that Mulch needed the money. He'd done very well out of the Artemis foul siege. 
well enough to take out a lease on a penthouse apartment in Beverly Hills. He'd stocked the apartment with a pioneer entertainment system, a full DVD library, and enough beef jerky to last a lifetime. Time for a decade of rest and relaxation. But life is not like that. It refuses to curl up and sit quietly in a corner. The habits of several centuries would not go away. Halfway through the James Bond collection, Mulch realized that he missed the bad old days. Soon the penthouse suite's reclusive occupant was taking midnight strolls. These strolls generally ended up inside other people's homes. Initially, Mulch just visited, savoring the thrill of defeating sophisticated mudman security systems. Then he began to take trophies. Small things, a crystal goblet, an ashtray, or a cat, if he was peckish. But soon Mulch Diggums began to crave the old notoriety, and his pilferings grew larger. Gold bars, goose egg diamonds, or pit bull terriers, if he was really famished. The Oscar thing began quite by accident. He nabbed one as a curiosity on a midweek break to New York. Best original screenplay. The following morning he was front page news coast to coast. You'd think he'd ripped off a medical convoy instead of a gilded statuette. Mulch, of course, was delighted. He'd found his new nocturnal pastime. In the next two weeks, Mulch filched Best Soundtrack and Best Special Effects Academy Awards. The tabloids went crazy. They even gave him a nickname, The Grouch, after another well-known Oscar. When Mulch read that one, his toes wriggled for joy. And dwarf toes wriggling are quite a sight. They are nimble as fingers, double-jointed, and the less said about the smell, the better. Mulch's mission became clear. He had to assemble an entire set. Over the next six months, the grouch struck all across the United States. He even made a trip to Italy to collect a Best Foreign Language Film Award. He had a special cabinet made with tinted glass that could be blacked out at the touch of a button. Mulch Diggums felt alive again. Of course, Oscar winners all over the planet tripled their security, which was just the way Mulch liked it. There was no challenge in breaking into a shack on the beach. High rise and high tech. That's what the public wanted. So that's what the grouch gave them. The papers ate it up. He was a hero. During the daylight hours, when he couldn't venture outside, Mulch busied himself writing the screenplay of his own exploits. Tonight was a big night. The last statuette. He was going for a Best Actress award. And not just any old Best Actress. Tonight's target was the tempestuous Jamaican beauty Maggie V. This year's winner for her portrayal of Precious, a tempestuous Jamaican beauty. Maggie V had stated publicly that if the Grouch tried anything in her apartment, he would get a lot more than he bargained for. How could Mulch resist a challenge like that? The building itself was easy to locate, a 10-story block of glass and steel just off Sunset Boulevard, a midnight stroll south of Mulch's own home. So the intrepid dwarf packed his tools, preparing to burglarize his way into the history books. Maggie V was on the top floor. There was no question of going up the stairs, elevator, or shaft. It would have to be an outside job. In preparation for the climb, Mulch had not had anything to drink in two days. Dwarf paws are not just for sweating. They can take in moisture too. Very handy when you are trapped in a cave in for days on end. Even if you can't get your mouth to a drink, every inch of skin can leach water from the surrounding earth. When a dwarf was thirsty, as Mulch was now, his paws opened to the size of pinholes, and began to suck like crazy. This could be extremely useful, if say, you had to climb up the side of a tall building. Mulch took off his shoes and gloves, donned a stolen lep helmet, and began to climb. Shoot E-37 Holly could feel the commander's glare crisping the hairs on the back of her neck. She tried to ignore it, concentrating on not dashing the Atlantean ambassador's shuttle against the walls of the Arctic chute. So, all this time, you knew Mulch Diggums was alive. Holly nudged the starboard thruster to avoid a missile of half-melted rock. Not for sure. Foley just had this theory. The commander wrung an imaginary neck. Foley why am I not surprised? Artemis smirked from his seat in the passenger area. Now, you two, 
We need to work together as a team. So tell me about Foley's theory, Captain, ordered Root, belting himself into the co-pilot's seat. Holly activated a static wash on the shuttle's external cameras. Positive and negative charges dislodged the sheets of dust from the lenses. Foley thought Mulcher's death a bit suspicious, given that he was the best tunnel fairy in the business. So why didn't he come to me? It was just a hunch. With respect, you know what you're like with hunches, Commander. Root nodded grudgingly. It was true, he didn't have time for hunches. It was hard evidence, or get out of my office until you've got some. The centaur did a bit of investigating on his own time. The first thing he realized was that the gold recovered was a bit light. I negotiated for the return of half the ransom, and by Foley's reckoning the cart was about two dozen bars short. The commander lit one of his trademark fungus cigars. He had to admit it sounded promising, gold missing, mulch diggums within a hundred miles. Two and two make four. As you know, it's standard procedure to spray any LEP property with selenium-based tracker, including the ransom gold. So, Foley runs a scan for selenium, and he picks up hot spots all over Los Angeles. Particularly at the Crowley Hotel in Beverly Hills. When he hacks into the building computer, he finds the penthouse resident is listed as one Lance Digger. Root's pointy ears quivered. Digger. Exactly, nodded Holly. A bit more than coincidence. Foley came to me at that point, and I advised him to get some satellite photos before taking the file to you. Except. Dot quote. Except Mr. Digger is proving very elusive. Am I right? Dead on. Root's coloring went from rose to tomato. Mulch, that rascal. How did he do it? Holly shrugged. We're guessing he transferred his iris cam to some local wildlife, maybe a rabbit. Then collapsed the tunnel. So the life signs we were reading belonged to some rabbit. Exactly. In theory. I'll kill him, exclaimed Root pounding the control panel. Can't this bucket go any faster? Los Angeles mulch scaled the building without much difficulty. There were external closed circuit cameras, but the helmet's ion filter showed exactly where these cameras were pointed. It was a simple matter to crawl along the blind spots. Within an hour, the dwarf was suckered outside Maggie V's apartment on the 10th floor. The windows were triple glazed with a bulletproof coating. Movie stars. Paranoid, every one of them. Naturally there was an alarm point sitting on top of the pane, and a motion sensor crouching on a wall like a frozen cricket. Only to be expected. Mulch melted a hole in the glass with a bottle of dwarf rock polish, used to clean up diamonds in the mines. Humans actually cut diamonds to shine them. Imagine. Half the stone down the drain. Next, the grouch used his helmet's ion filter to sweep the room for the motion sensor's range. The red ion stream revealed that the sensor was focused on the floor. No matter. Mulch intended going along the wall. Paws still crying out for water, the dwarf crept along the partition, making maximum use of a stainless steel shelving system that almost completely surrounded the main sitting room. The next step was to find the actual Oscar. It could be hidden anywhere, including under Maggie V's pillow, but this room was as good a place to start as any. You never know, he might get lucky. Mulch activated the helmet's X-ray filter, scanning the walls for a safe. Nothing. He tried the floor. Humans were getting smarter these days. There, under a fake zebra rug, a metal cuboid. Easy. The grouch approached the motion sensor from above, very gently twisting the neck until the gadget was surveying the ceiling. The floor was now safe. Mulch dropped to the rug testing the surface with his tactile toes. No pressure pads sewn into the rug's lining. He rolled back the fake fur, revealing a hatch in the wooden floor. The joins were barely visible to the naked eye. But Mulch was an expert, and his eyes weren't naked, they were aided by LEP zoom lenses. He wormed a nail into the crack, flipping the hatch. The safe itself was a bit of a disappointment, not even lead-lined. He could see right into the mechanism with the X-ray filter. A simple combination lock. Only three digits. Mulch turned the filter off. What was the point in breaking a see-through lock? Instead he put his ear to the door, jiggling the dial. 
In 15 seconds the door was open at his feet. The Oscars gold plating winked at him. Mulch made a big mistake at that moment. He relaxed. In the Groucher's mind he was already back in his own apartment, swigging from a two-gallon bottle of ice-cold water. And relaxed thieves are destined for prison. Mulch neglected to check the statuette for traps, plucking it straight from the safe. If he had checked, he would have realized that there was a wire attached magnetically to the base. When the Oscar was moved, a circuit was broken, allowing all hell to break loose. Shoot E-37 Holly set the autopilot to hover at 10,000 feet below the surface. She slapped herself on the chest to release the harness, then joined the others in the rear of the shuttle. Two problems. Firstly, if we go any lower, we'll be picked up on the scanners, presuming they're still operating. Why am I not looking forward to number two? Asked Butler. Secondly, this particular chute was retired when we pulled out of the Arctic. Which means, which means the supply tunnels were collapsed. We have no way into the chute system without supply tunnels. No problem, declared Root. We blast the wall. Holly sighed. With what, Commander? This is a diplomatic craft. We don't have any cannons. Butler plucked two concussor eggs from a pouch on his moon belt. Will these do? Foley thought they might come in handy. Artemis groaned. If he didn't know better, he'd swear the manservant was enjoying this.